prayer before the Lord before we read the, the scriptures. Our Father, we come to your throne of grace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come to confess our need for your help as we look at your word together. We pray, Lord God, that you would, you would speak to us, give us ears to hear, and give us hearts to respond in love and delight to your truth, and Father, wills to obey. Father, where we need to be comforted, would you bring comfort? Where you need to challenge us, would you bring challenge? Where, Lord, we don't yet know you, anyone in this place doesn't yet know you, we pray that you would speak and reveal Jesus. Father, let us hear your voice, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 40. Psalm 40, starting to read at verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon the rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O oh Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonour who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy. The Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Praise the Lord for his word. Now this psalm has been used quite a little bit in the history of Lansdowne. Some of you during the pandemic, the first part of the pandemic, asked to receive from me a daily devotional. And there was almost a month of devotionals from Psalm 40 back in 2020. 
Our brother, our brother Ken preached on Psalm 40 in 2016. And last year, Mark, in May last year, Mark also preached from this psalm. So why are we going back to it? Well, firstly, we're doing a series on the book of Psalms, which we've returned to just for a little while before we go back to Luke. I thought about skipping this psalm because it's already been dealt with quite a bit in the history of Lansdowne in recent years, but having reflected on it, there are so many riches for us that I trust it will benefit us to go back to it again. I think there are perhaps two main lessons for us. I've entitled, the first is this, I've entitled the message Looking Back in Order to Look Forward. And that's essentially what this psalm does. In the first 10 verses, David is looking back to a time of trouble where he was in the pit, where, verse 1, he was waiting and waiting for the Lord to answer, and his testimony of deliverance and his response to that deliverance in terms of his service and his praise to the Lord. And then in verse 11 and 12, the problems start again. And so he deals, responds to the problems of today by looking back at how God has helped him in the past. And that encourages him to press on for a new set of troubles that have come upon him in the second half of the psalm. But also, this psalm teaches us about Jesus. I don't know if you spotted in the reading that Les read to us from Hebrews chapter 10. But in Hebrews chapter 10, this psalm is quoted. And it's very interesting. It says in Hebrews 10 and verse 5, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said. That is, Jesus said. And then it quotes from Psalm 40. And a lot of commentators just say, well, it's just those few words in the middle of Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8, that are Jesus speaking. But if you actually look at the psalm, Jesus went to the pit for us, he suffered in our place for us. Jesus was that one perfect sacrifice in verse Six, he is the one who came to do the will of the Father. And then in verse 16, we see Jesus praying for all of God's people. It says, may those all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As Jesus intercedes that we would persevere through our, through our troubles until that day when we see him face to face. And indeed, Jesus prays for his disciples and prays for us in that high priestly prayer before he went to the cross. So John 17 and verse 13. And he, in his prayer, he says, Now I am coming to you, Father, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And in John 17, verse 24, Jesus prays this, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may see me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. So there in Psalm 40, Jesus is interceding for us it's praying for us that that day will come when we will see face to face and say, great is the Lord, or the language revelation, worthy is the Lamb. So it's Psalm 40 teaches us to look back in a good way, not with regret, but look back at the good things 
and deliverances God has brought into our lives to help us to keep trusting him today. But to look back supremely at the cross. That's why we had a number of songs about the cross. To look back at the cross and to see there Jesus brought about the greatest deliverance. So if we are in a pit of trouble now, which meant some of us are, we can look back to the cross and see the greatest need, the greatest trouble, our sin, was dealt with upon the cross. And we can have confidence of his intercession for us. Notice verse 17 says, As for me, I am poor and needy. But we have a mighty, praying Saviour who intercedes at God's right hand and takes our poor and needy prayers and uses them for his glory. That's a summary. Let's get into the detail now. The first thing we see is a testimony of God's transforming grace. Jump down to verse 2. He drew me up from the pit of destruction. A pit that's somewhere deep. It may have been an empty cistern like Joseph was thrown into or Jeremiah was thrown into and they were subsequently brought out. It's a pit of destruction, a pit that is like a roaring wilderness of trouble. So that's great danger. Feeling far away from God, as it were, you can't get lower than being in a pit. Being a pit of sorrow, a pit of despair, a, a pit of sickness, a pit of difficult circumstances. And we feel right down there, uh, like the enemy is roaring at us, and we are in the wilderness. But the second aspect of this trouble, in the second line of verse 2, is described as a miry bog. A bog is like a swamp where if you walk on it, you sink and it stinks. That suggests that also Indeed, David says himself in verse 12 that some of the pit was actually his sin. And sin stinks in the sight of God. And, he was, and sin sticks to us like mud sticks to us. And so he's in a situation of great trouble, but also acutely aware of the stench of his sin. Where are you today? Are you in a pit of trouble? A pit of fear? A pit of circumstances are, are really getting to you? Do you feel like you're sinking under the weight of that? Either the trouble itself or the sin that keeps coming back into your life? That was David's situation. And once again, we don't have a Bible that simply tells us what God requires. It shows us the reality of the spiritual, physical, emotional battles we face living in a fallen world. And we meet people just like us. So that we don't need to despair and think it's only me in this situation. I must be a terrible Christian to be in this situation. Well, David was the man of the God's own heart, and he, he is praying this. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, while it wasn't his own sin, it was our sin, he carried that for us. And so, we can have confidence when we're in the pit to pray. And that's what he does. Ver verse 1, jump back to verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, literal translation of that is I waited, waited for the Lord. The word waited is repeated here in the first line. That he's almost like waiting for the waiting to be over. But notice this. 
he's waiting for the Lord. I mean, this is really interesting because when I came, but I'll use myself as an illustration, not because I'm good, but I hope because it helps. When I came back after my operation in March, I was told you would have, I would have severe pain for several days. The temptation I faced was to be counting down the days, waiting for the pain days to come to an end, rather than waiting on the Lord. And so often we feel our solution is a problem to go away, rather than for us to meet with God, and for God to come in and, and, and deal with us. That's what David is doing. He's like hanging in there. That's another translation of this phrase, I waited patiently, I'm hanging in there, but I'm hanging not on the side of a, clump, a crumbling cliff or a broken branch that may drop at any minute, but I'm hanging in there, hanging on to the Lord, who is the covenant-keeping faithful God for whom nothing is too difficult. And then notice, we see that the Lord responds the second line of verse 40. He inclined to me and heard my cry. And this idea of inclining it is a picture of a, a father bending down to a child or a shepherd bending down to a sheep. And when you, uh, so often we, we, we talk over little ones, don't we? You see parents who are too busy on their phones to notice their child. This is not our Father in heaven. He stoops down to us. He comes and meets with us. He comes, as it were, and looks us in the eye. He comes and bends, as it were, down. He doesn't need to in one sense. It's a word picture. He's here anyway. It's a word picture of him, as it were, stooping down from heaven to listen to the faintest cry. And notice this, he inclined to me. You know sometimes you hear something and you, 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 you kind of don't know where the noise is coming from. But here is a personal bending down. It's not a kind of shouting at someone across the room. It's a turning to us personally. The NIV, I think, translates this, and he turned to me. And he hasn't changed. David's God is your God, and he turns to you. You are not alone. He is with you. And then we see rescue. Verse 2, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. He came and lifted me. But he didn't just lift me and leave me dangling. The second half of verse 2 and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. It's a place of solidity, a place where we're not going to sink any more. And of course, the greatest thing of all is our salvation. And there, there are times it seems that like the trouble is continuing, but we feel secure. We've come to that place where God has answer the prayer in that we're no longer sinking. We're still facing the challenge, we're still facing temptation, we're still, our loved one is still not with us. Our children have not yet come back to the Lord. Our boss is still very frustrating. Our landlord is still, has still got the rent at a high level. Whatever it might be, the circumstances seem to still remain, but something's changed. And what has changed is that, is that the Lord has now, as it were, come to lift up your feet and set your feet upon himself and the solid rock of his unchanging promises and the awareness of his presence with you. That is what he does. And yes, he does change the circumstances. But that's not always the first thing he does. First thing is often, now I'm no longer sinking. He is with me. And of course, this is filled, fulfilled supremely in the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the pits 
of death and separation from the Father's love for our sin. Who carried the stench of our sin upon the cross. Who, as it were, was in that wasteland of, of said separation from, from God. Who went down to the grave. But he rose victorious forever. He's fulfilled his son. And so when we're in the pit, he's with us. Doesn't leave us. We stand secure. No wonder David says, he put a new song in my mouth, verse 3. When he realizes the depths to which the Lord has come to stoop down to him and to rescue him and to make his steps secure so he's no longer sinking, he begins to burst forth in great praise. And he's like he's calling other people to join him. Because notice the second line of verse 3, it says a song of praise to our God, not my God. So he starts with, he put a new song in my mouth. But he's saying, come on, praise with me. That is why it's so good to give testimony of what God has done in your life uh, uh, to other believers, even on a Sunday, so that other people can join in praising God. Have a testimony. Please let one of the elders know. So we can find time in a morning service so that other people can share or time the prayer meeting for you to share so that we can join in praising. But you, if we carry on reflecting on the Lord Jesus Christ, if he has risen from the dead and defeated death and taken away our sin, how can we, his people, stay silent? How can we say nothing? How can we sit in the church and think about the cross and just think, oh, that's nice, no, this is utter life-transforming grace that he has given to us. This is rescuing us from darkness and bringing us into his light. Therefore, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our respect. Our, I don't know why the lights come on behind me. Please ignore it. It's on, obviously on some kind of timer. It's not part of the, the program or the... Oh, it's not some dramatic thing I've programmed to go in there, just appeared, sorry about that. But, to use it as an illustration, when we see afresh what, the cross, what Jesus has done for us on the cross, it should turn the light on in our hearts and cause us to praise him. Cause us to be in awe of him. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And so, David looks back, and we look back on what God's done in, in our lives. We look back on David's life. We look back on Joseph and Jeremiah who were lifted from a pit of destruction. And we look back on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that causes us to praise. But secondly, we see a call to trust. A call to trust. Having said at the end of verse 3, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord, he now says, verse 4, blessed or happy is the man who makes the Lord his trust. That phrase, blessed, blessed is a man who makes, blessed comes right from the beginning of the psalm, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counts of the wicked. Blessed is the man who makes the, the law of the Lord his meditation day and night. He's now saying you are truly happy. You will truly have peace when you put your trust in the Lord. That speaks of salvation. That speaks of ongoing trust. When we're focused upon our troubles, we are not happy. We lose our peace. When our focus is the Lord, then we have that peace. And notice he talks about the opposite. Those who, who do not turn to the proud. And the word there is the word Rahab, which is the nickname that Israel gave to Egypt 
in Isaiah 30, who was supposed to come and help them, rescue them from the Assyrians, and they didn't come. And Rahab was something very proud, but actually mounted to nothing. And you know, if we trust anything other than Jesus, it will mount to nothing. It cannot bear the weight. Not even another person close to us can bear the weight of our ultimate trust. Some of you have got spouses. They can't bear the weight of your ultimate trust. That is your trust for them to be perfect in everything. Don't put that trust in them. You put that trust in the Lord who will never fail you. He says, don't turn either to a lie. That's talking about false gods. And then in contrast, this is the, again the call to trust. Verse 5, you have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts to us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Such an amazing God. And notice it says, you have multiplied your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. This is not just a little bit of God's goodness. This is a multiplication of God's goodness. This is an abundance of God's goodness. And notice it's not just God's deeds, it's God's thoughts. God's plans and purposes for us. We don't understand God's plans and something they lead us through difficult times, but they are still good and wondrous thoughts. So it says in Psalm 139 and verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Sometimes we forget people, don't we? We forget our friend. We forget to call them. We forget to contact our family. We get distracted. But there are a multiplication of thoughts that God has for you. He, as it were, if I put it reverently this way, you are always on his mind. You are always, he always looks upon you and always cares for you. And he has good and perfect plans for you. And so, a psalmist can say, none can compare with you. Maybe listening to Moses, it's saying, there is no one like the Lord. That's Exodus 15, 11. And maybe, as John the Apostle was writing John's Gospel, he had this verse in mind. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Because in John 21 and verse 25, John said this, if I'd recorded everything that Jesus had done, there would not be enough books in the world to contain it all. That is our God. That is our God. Testimony of deliverance and a call to trust and worship. Thirdly, a response of commitment and worship. In verse 60, sorry, verse 6, David outlines basically the key sacrifices. So in sacrifice, which is a general word for sacrifices, and offering, that's the grain offering, you have not delighted. The third line, burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. Now, of course, we know those are in the law, but what David is saying here, as the prophets often said, to simply offer a sacrifice without the heart is nothing. And David said, I'm not prepared to be like that. I don't want to just simply bring you a sacrifice. What I want to do is to have my ears unblocked. In the second line there of verse 6, you've given me an open ear, or it should actually say open ears in the plural. So, so you have dug out my ears. I have to do that from time to time, as some of you, I'm sure you do, because your ears get filled with wax, and we can't hear people. And so, what, what, what David is saying is, I want my ears to be unblocked, so that I can hear you. 
And in particular, verse 7, so I can read the book, I can read the scroll, so that verse 8, I will do your will because your law is on my heart. Now David's speaking in this way. He's saying, he's thinking of, the, of what was written in Deuteronomy 17 and verses 18 to 20, which said that the king had to take the law of the Lord and write it in a scroll. And he had to write it down and he had to meditate upon it. So he'd be careful to obey the law of the Lord. That's Deuteronomy 7, 18 to 20. This is what's in David's mind here. I want to be listening to the law of the Lord my God so that law is written upon my heart. So that I, as the word is in my heart, my response, verse 8, is I delight to do your will. And you know, as those who receive the gospel, as those who receive the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, how much more should that be our response that we want that the word of God to be written upon our heart? And of course, God's, the Bible, God has given to everybody. But there's a sense in which God has given each and every one of us the Bible. It is from him. It's the means by which we hear his voice is as we reflect upon it and find it's been written for us, for our learning, so that we can hear God, so that we can meet with him, so that the powerful word can change us. That is what he has done for us. And that is how we must respond. And you know, when we find it hard to obey the Lord, to respond in obedience, we kind of say, oh, well, I just give up. But notice verse 8, the link between delight and God's word being in his heart. How do you begin to delight to do God's will? You begin to delight to do God's will by having his word in your heart. And if he's done, or rather since he's done all of this for us, surely we should be having the word of God in our heart. But remember that this, these three verses were spoken about the Lord Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10. And indeed it is all about him. You've given me an open ear. That is a, a pointer to something that Isaiah prophesies. Even though it was written before Isaiah prophesied, this is what is spoken of the Lord Jesus in Isaiah 50 and verse 5. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. And listen to this. This is Isaiah 50, verse 5. And the very next verse, so the not being rebellious, the fulfilling what was written about him includes... Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and spitting. So when it says it's been written of me in the book, as this, these verses fulfill the Lord Jesus, saying, you open my ears to hear your voice, that I would come Delighting in your law, living in perfect obedience to all your commands, and offer myself in place of all these sacrifices. Offer myself on behalf of sinners. I will fulfill those sacrifices. I will be the one offering once for all, Hebrews 10, 14. He, will, he is, as we sang in that song, Jesus, my sacrifice, who died in our place and defeated death. He always did what pleased the Father. All of the Old Testament is all about him. As we said to the, on the road to Emmaus, he opened the scriptures concerning himself. 
And now because of his sacrifice, we can be, as Romans 12 verse 1 says, we can be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. Tim Keller says, and this was something Mark put on the men's WhatsApp group, you have been saved through a dying sacrifice, so you are free to be a living sacrifice. Jesus gave himself, set you free, fulfilling everything written about him. And again, no wonder we then get to verses 8 to 9. There we see Jesus, the worship leader, leading us in praise, saying, I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. I've not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. And he goes on, verse 10, to proclaim literally God's righteousness, God's righteousness and God's faithfulness and salvation, God's uh, steadfast love and faithfulness in the great congregation. And these wonderful verses are appointed to what we should be doing on a Sunday. Do we restrain our lips? Do we hide his love in our hearts? Or do we open up our mouths and lift up our voices and celebrate his goodness? And you know, again, this anticipates something. When you go to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, you find there's a great congregation a great assembly that no man can number before the throne, from every tribe and people and language, under heaven, standing before the throne. So Jesus, who's offered himself as a sacrifice, now leads us forward. We taste it on earth. We taste on earth, but we're looking forward to that day in that great congregation when we stand before the throne. Praise his name. And wouldn't it be great if the psalm ended there? <laughs> That's a great way to end, praising him in the great congregation. But then we have verse 11. And we see in verse 11 and 12 that the battle isn't over yet. The battle isn't over yet. I used to wish that, that when a person was baptised, they just went straight to heaven. Wonderful. No more trouble. But then again, who be left to baptize the new believers? No, we actually live in a fallen world and we experience trouble. And I want just to highlight this point for you. Because I think when we experience a victory, when circumstances change, we kind of think, that's it now, no more trouble. And then often we get discouraged when trouble happens again. Well, here it is in the Bible. A victory is something to thank God for. The ultimate victory of our salvation is something we can praise God for all the time. But we need to realize that trouble lies ahead until this earthly race is over. And so in verse 12, David speaks of evil. That's bad things in general. And then he also again speaks of his sin. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They're more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails me. You've felt like you've just lost your energy. You've lost purpose. You've lost your peace because of trouble, or your sin, or both. But just jump back to verse 11. As for you, Lord, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. And then look back to verse 10. The second part of verse 10, I've not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Notice that out of the praise of verse 10, 
David has confidence to face his troubles. That is why we need to look back in order to look forward and go back to the faithfulness of God, God's covenant love that will never be broken to give us confidence to stand when evil things happen to us and when we do evil because we sin. We have a covenant keeping God and we can confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so out of that confidence, David begins to pray. Verse 13, so please deliver me again. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And if you jump down to verse 17, the very last line says, do not delay, O my God. So this final prayer is bracketed by, Lord, please hurry. Now, wait a minute. Didn't David say, I waited patiently? Yes, he did. But praying with urgency doesn't contradict waiting provided our urgent praying is combined with a trust in God's perfect timing. We can say to God, we long for it now, come now, yet we still need to be saying, Lord, your will be done. Your will be done. And notice there, as the, 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 the psalm draws to a close, we see in verses 14 and 15, the reality that David is facing of the triumph of the enemy. And remember Psalm 38, we said we'd be real with God, real about what is happening in our lives. The enemy is going, aha, aha, verse 15, which is a sign of triumph and, and victory. And then verse 16, he's saying, Lord, the reason you can help me is that will give you glory. And then in verse 17, he has self-revelation. As for me, I'm poor and needy. And you know, that is actually very important, that we see ourselves as needing him. Not my solution, but his. And then we see him refocusing. Verse 17, the second line, the Lord takes thought for me. He's mentioned that already. Multiply are your thoughts towards us. Verse 5. The Lord takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Do not delay. So out of that foundation, as for you, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. Therefore, I can go and say, Lord, I'll be real with you. And I want to refocus myself upon you once again. And this is how we need to pray until that final song. When we are declaring worthy is the Lamb. This is how we need to pray. Looking back, what God has done in Christ, what God has done for me. And now I have the confidence looking at who he is to pray today. And we rest in Christ's intercession for us. Remember we said this is a prayer that points us to Jesus. Verse 11. Jesus is the one who through the blood of the everlasting covenant has brought us into life. He mentions there in verse 11, his covenant love, your steadfast love. The Lord is praying for our preservation. Verse 12, the Lord is representing our need as sinners, as the sinless one who died for sinners. In verse 13 and 17, this cry, do not delay, well, and, and I am poor and needy. Well, he is our mighty and strong saviour who represents us before the Father. 
He is, verse 14 and 15, the mighty judge who will defeat evil. And that's why it's so important that we are not outside of his kingdom, but in his kingdom. Because those who have rejected him will ultimately be rejected. And he is the one who is looking to that day when we gather with him around the throne where he is seated at God's right hand and worship and declare, great is the Lord. And you know, the prayers of Jesus are answered. And so when you feel, I can't go on, I'm going to give up being a Christian, I don't know if he will ever get me home, well, when Jesus prays for us that God's covenant love will preserve us, verse 11, when Jesus prays for us that those who see his salvation will say, great is the Lord, he is praying for us to be joining on that day before the throne, Revelation 5 and verse 9, declaring, worthy is the Lamb. So his prayers for you, as outlined by Psalm 40, are your security and guarantee that you will stand before his throne if you're a believer. And you'll be worshipping him forever. That's where you're going. And so, brothers and sisters, as we close, let's not go into panic mode when we pray. Let's not just worry generally in the direction of God, as often we do. We just kind of go through our worries and kind of really look at God. No, let's actively look back to Scripture. Look back to David. Look back at his deliverance in Scripture. Look back to Jesus on the cross and the victory he won for us. Look back over our own lives and look up to him, our great intercessor. Look up. He's there, praying for you right now. And this reality of our victorious and praying Saviour means you will never be abandoned in your troubles. You will never be left alone. They, and they will never ultimately defeat you. You may fall down, but you'll still go to glory. Because if you are truly a believer, no trouble will ultimately destroy you. Because he's interceding for you. And he's been to the lowest pit of all to save you from your sin. Brothers and sisters, let's press on. Let's press on today. Let's press on through tomorrow. Let's press on whatever next week will bring. Let's press on the upward way to glory because he is with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful psalm. Thank you for the way it speaks into our situation. Thank you for the way it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray you would help us to look back in faith over all that you have done in Scripture, in our lives, and supremely in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to look up to him, our victorious Saviour, who even now from the throne leads us in a life of worship and delight until that day when through whatever toil and snare and trouble we go through, we will be declaring, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We thank you, Father, in his name. Amen.